Hi everyone, you're watching the Heather Rifford Show Season 9 Specials and I'm your host Heather Rifford. Today I've been joined by a council member, Tyler Dos Santos Tam, who is serving District 6 on the Honolulu City Council since 2022. Um, he has served on uh, and continues to serve on different committees as chair for executive matters and legal affairs, uh, as well as transportation. So he's the chair for both of them. Um, he's also the vice chair of zoning and he also serves on the housing, sustainability and health committee, uh, as well as public safety. So these are all very important roles that he has undertaken since assuming office in 2022. Um, and we'll be talking to him a bit more about um, uh, the situation in Honolulu with regards to um, uh, different issues. But first, we before we get into it, um, I would like to welcome Tyler. Tyler, thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure having you on my show. Well, thanks for the opportunity to um, speak with you and your listeners. Of course. So, Tyler, um, before I dig deep into the specifics of what what you're doing currently in your role as council member of of uh, the Honolulu um, a city council, I wanted to ask you uh, a bit about yourself. So give our viewers uh, some background about yourself. Where did you grow up and how has living in Hawaii been like for you? Yeah, well, I was born and raised here in Honolulu, which is the capital of Hawaii. Um, if you've ever been to Hawaii, you know that there are um, immigrant groups from all over the world who have come to call Hawaii home. It's very multiracial. And um, my family's a reflection of that. My dad is Chinese. My mom is Filipino and Portuguese. And I represent a really diverse community, which is wonderful. My community um, includes the downtown area of Honolulu, as well as the Chinatown area, and then all of the surrounding residential communities. So I have about 120,000 residents in my district. For the entire island of Oahu, which is um, governed by the, the city and county of Honolulu, there are nine council members total. So between the nine of us, uh, we share the entire island, um, but my district is only part of that. Right. Prior to being a council member, I worked for six years as the executive director of a group called the Hawaii Construction Alliance. It's a group that's made up of five of the construction unions. And so my job was to advocate on behalf of um, our construction workers who are carpenters and masons, um, general construction laborers, bricklayers, and um uh, cement masons and heavy machine operators. And so it's uh, a really, it, it gave me a lot of perspective into the issues that working people face, issues uh, dealing with infrastructure and transportation, and issues involving housing as well. I also worked um, for two years. I was elected chair of the Democratic Party for the state of Hawaii. And uh, that was from 2020 to 2022. And so um, I uh, led the uh, campaign of white, like Joe Biden, president, and, um, you know, continue to be involved in many uh, political ways. That's great. Um, now, since assuming office in 2022, actually, before getting to that, what really sparked an interest in public service? You know, I think it's about making your community a better place and giving back. And I think everybody has some way that they can do that. It doesn't need to be through government. It doesn't need to be through the political arena. Mm -hmm. But everybody does have a gift that, um, you know, they can provide to others. And so um, in, in thinking about how to make my community a better place, um, you know, I got involved in our uh, very lowest level of government, uh, in Honolulu, which is our neighborhood board system. Mm -hmm. um, every neighborhood has a council of their own um, made of volunteers who meet once a month to talk about issues in the community and provide recommendations. And so in the neighborhood that I grew up in, um, I was on that uh, board for six years and really got to see um, and get to know a lot of the issues in the community. Mm -hmm. Now, since assuming office in 2022, what important uh, legislative uh, milestones have you been able to achieve in Honolulu particularly? 
Yeah, well, you know, Honolulu, just like every other um, large city around the world, we face a lot of similar issues, mm -hmm. whether that's the cost of housing. Um, Hawaii, of course, is also a really um, well-known tourist destination. And like many tourist destinations around the world, um, we want to make sure that our local people can afford to stay here. They're not being um, priced out or forced out by, um, you know, visitors. Um, and then uh, also we have our infrastructure issues. But one thing that I was particularly proud of, um, and this is relevant, I think, for uh, your viewers from all over the world, um, Honolulu became the first city in the United States and perhaps the first city around the world to uh, require that every bar and pub and nightclub um, have Narcan spray, which is naloxone. It's the opioid reversal spray. As you know, um, drugs, in particular synthetic new drugs like fentanyl and opioids, um, are becoming very, very prevalent, and uh, it's leading to a lot of overdoses, which burdens our hospital system. And so we're, we uh, became the first city in the country and perhaps the world last year to require every bar and nightclub to have um, this available in case there's an overdose on their premises or even an overdose you know, nearby. Um, you know that every bar and nightclub has this, so you can go and get it if needed. Um, a few other areas that... I'm really proud of working on is um, uh, helping to increase the housing stock in Honolulu and helping to push forward legislation um, to help incentivize the construction of more affordable housing. Yeah, uh, it's interesting that you brought fentanyl up because I will be talking to you about that later in the interview. But um, I want to raise the issue of crime and homelessness that remain major roadblocks. I was reading this um, as a news source in the downtown and Chinatown areas where you serve as council member. Um, and as someone who uses public transport, I have I bear witness to this. So what are you doing in your capacity to address the issue of homelessness and improve crime rates in these particular districts or areas per se? Yeah, so there's a few things, um, you know, there's our, our downtown Chinatown neighborhoods are very much in the center of the city. And so, you know, there's a lot of workers, there's a lot of small businesses. Um, and it is really a gathering place for everyone. And that includes our homeless uh, population. For homelessness, there's a few things. One is we need to increase the uh, stock of housing. Um, we simply have not built enough housing units for our population whether you're um, very poor, whether you're homeless, or even um, in the middle class or upper class, we just don't have enough housing to go around. And so part of the solution is uh, increasing the housing stock. I think increasing the housing stock deals with one of the three subgroups that uh, make up our homeless population. And that is people who are genuinely unsheltered, for whom a lack of housing is really the, the key issue. I think the second issue is um, there is a lot of mental illness and other issues that um, either force people onto the street or become much worse when you become homeless. And so, you know, that's an area where we're going to have to work with the state of Hawaii and the federal government um, to address that. But what we've done uh, in conjunction with the mayor is expanded the available um beds for people experiencing uh, mental health care crises and um, hopefully creating a situation where they have access to services um, in the Chinatown area and in the nearby neighborhoods. I think the last group, um, and this is uh, similar to the mental health issues, is um, people who are uh, addicted to drugs, have other addiction issues. Um, you know, that's a really hard cycle to break. Um, and so, again, this involves treatment, um, wraparound services, but they need to be willing to um, accept these kinds of services. You know, a lot of them reject these services um, and end up on the street for years. And that's I think that's the toughest population to get to mm -hmm. in terms of crime. You know, part of it is we have a shortage of police officers. Um, we need. Uh, about 400 additional police officers for the entire island. And that means that because we're short of officers, um, every district of the island uh, doesn't have enough police officers for every shift. So what we've done is um, I put in specific funding for the Chinatown area, knowing that we need more police um, presence and availability. 
and also ask them not just to sit in their police car or not just sit in the police station, but to make sure that during every shift, they're out walking around, um, they're available to the public, they are seen by the public. And I think that that also makes a difference. The perception that the police are available, that they're responsive, I think helps to um, create a situation where community members feel safe and they feel that the police can be a positive resource. Definitely. Um, I think it's really important for, for these, I, I would call these marginalized populations, especially who are living on the sidelines, who have no um, who have no means of, of surviving in, in a very expensive state uh, in, in the United States. So I want to move on to infrastructure development a little bit, because oftentimes uh, infrastructure improvement is equated with better livelihood for all people. But that is also not true because although people who are applying for these jobs who are going to be part of these facilities that are newly opening up, um, unless it's benefiting them, it's not benefiting those people who are basically out of jobs or are living like on the streets or neighborhoods where these infrastructures are being developed. So um, do you think that it's more, I think, benefiting the economy or the or the tourism sector. So do you think that in your capacity as council member, the focus should be less on revitalizing infrastructures and more emphasis should be drawn on um, improving livelihoods of the population that are marred by the issues that you mentioned, such as drug use, crimes and homelessness? Yeah, you know, I think the answer is that we have to do both. But we also have to ask ourselves, what is our city government best at? What is our state government best at and what is the federal government best at when it comes to their different roles in addressing these issues? Um, you know, the city government deals with our roads. They deal with our water and sewer lines. They also deal with our public transportation. And so those are areas that we can really focus on. Like I just mentioned, the city government also runs our police department and fire department. And so, you know, making sure that those services are really uh, top quality services is, is important. The state government addresses, I think, a lot of the um, human needs issues like health care, accessibility, um, like uh, many of the mental uh, services um, that very marginalized populations need. Um, and the federal government also has a role in this. So I think it's, it's how do we set aside the areas that we are best suited at and really focusing on it. And so when it comes to, you know, kind of marginalized populations or people who need a hand up, our city government um, can really start from the bottom up on that, making sure that we have really high quality um, public transportation. Um, as a transportation committee chair, um, this is something that I, I work on very often. I also take our public bus. Um, I think I'm one of the very few uh, politicians uh, in Hawaii that uh, takes our public transportation um, on a very regular basis, um, pretty much every day. And so I wanna make sure that people can get to the services that they need, to their jobs, um, take their kids to school if that's um, how they get to school. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we, we need, but we also need to make sure that we are doing it in a way that um, is, that makes sense financially for them. Um, so we need to have, you know, a tax structure where uh, we're not burdening uh, our working class people and that the services um, that they really need are provided by the government um, rather than having to pay for it um, out of their own pockets because they're struggling. Yes. And council member, there is also a direct correlation. I'm, I'm moving on to the, the next subject here. So there's a direct correlation with drugs, in particular um, fentanyl, one of them being fentanyl, uh, with crime in, in Hawaii. Um, and then most common offenses that are linked with drugs, uh, according to the police, are auto thefts, break-ins, and burglary. So, so drug use is actually linked to crime. So the Hawaii County Police also seized more than 191 grams of fentanyl in January and February of this year alone, So, which is enough to kill more than 95,000 people. And Hawaii is already such a small state. So the practice of smuggling this kind of drug, I was reading up on this as well, is 
very um, cost effective and cheap where you can use the mailing services such as um, d different kind of uh, services, FedEx and, and other services to smuggle these drugs as well. And these are highly addictive drugs. So um, and it has a correlation with crime. So is there a check and balance in place to seize control and take back control of this of this um, of these drugs? And also to stop this practice all over because it is increasing crimes as well. Yeah, you know, I think you've really focused on a core issue that we have. We have 11 million visitors that come in on airplanes every year. And that's not to mention the Hawaii residents that, you know, go back and forth to other destinations. You know, there are uh, millions of packages each day that arrive here in the mail. And so it's impossible for us to screen every single package. And so part of it is making sure that the, uh, these networks of drug dealers and drug smugglers, that we're investigating them, that we're trying to crack down on them as much as possible and disrupt their ability to bring in um, these drugs. And so one thing that I, I want to also mention is that we found that there is a connection between uh, these drug uh, networks and people that operate illegal gambling operations. And so we're also trying to crack down on these illegal gambling operations because they are um, hubs for distributing drugs in these neighborhoods. Um, and so by disrupting these networks, we're hoping to you know, slowly but surely uh, reduce the amount of fentanyl and other um, really addictive and, and very dangerous drugs in the community. We also have to be concerned about the people who are either using these drugs uh, purposefully or the people who are accidentally getting exposed. And we are finding in the community that there are, uh, uh, there's a growing number of people who are accidentally overdosing. Um, one difference between fentanyl and these other synthetic drugs and the types of drugs that, you know, uh, maybe were used in the past, is that now we're seeing um, fentanyl being used by all types of people, um, either purposefully or accidentally. You know, uh, there are counterfeit prescription drugs um, that people are using. And so the typical profile of somebody um, who overdoses from fentanyl is not what you might think of as a, a traditional sort of, you know, druggy. Um, to, to use that term. It's not the kind of, of person you might imagine uh, 20 or 30 years ago who's addicted to heroin or some other type of drug out there. And so this is a community-wide concern and it needs uh, a community-wide response. And also regarding your point of community response, I feel it's a it's a very collaborative effort too, and very syn synergized effort with not just uh, the council members that you're talking about, but also with the police department, and then also having um, having a general awareness of the issue too in, in the public, just to make sure that there's a check and balance in place. Yes, and these are things that we shouldn't be afraid to talk about. I, I think sometimes there's a shame or stigma around talking about this issue, but it's very real in very many communities. And I think we need to talk about it um, a lot more. And then, you know, every time that we're able to prevent an overdose, um, that's also preventing the ambulance from having to serve, um, to show up, uh, which is very expensive, avoiding very expensive hospital bills um, that eventually... Uh, the government has to pay for. And so um, there are many uh, spillover effects from this. Yeah, and I think these are difficult conversations to have, and I think that's going to lead mm -hmm. to some some good results too. So thank you so much, Council Member, for joining me. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Um, that is all for now. Uh, stay tuned for more on my official YouTube channel and Facebook page. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.